Welcome back to Greenwood Gab. I'm Natalie. And I'm Sarah. And we're back with another Southside Reads episode. Yay! Southside Reads! Yay! (laughs) Yay, Southside Reads, yay. This month's theme was book to screen. We put together, not only are we going to be talking about the books that we actually read for this month, because we actually read them before the podcast this month. Look at us! Look at us. Look at us. We also put together a list of other books that have been made into movies to talk about today since we don't have a guest. Yeah. Sad that there's no special guest. But last episode, the Bam Books episode, we had so many guests that we thought maybe we should scale it back to just the Natalie and Sarah show. We were jealous that we didn't get to talk a lot during that one. It's true. And you all missed Sarah just like raising the roof. I know. There was a lot of (laughs) a lot of hand gesture that you don't get with a podcast. Okay, so who wants to start with, I guess we'll start with the Southside Reads books. Okay. So which books we chose for the book discussion? Well, I'll go first. So I picked... I was hoping you would go. (laughs) I picked Heartstopper, Volume 1 by Alice Oseman. You may be familiar with the Netflix series Heartstopper that came out not too long ago, within the last year. I mentioned in the September events episode that I had served on on the Virginia Library Association's Graphic Novel Diversity Award Committee. As part of that, this past year, I read volume three of Heartstopper because it was submitted to our committee to read. But I hadn't read the first two volumes. And then I went and I watched the show. And so I know what happened in the first two volumes because that's what the show is about. But I thought it would be nice to kind of go back and read the original material. So I've read volume one. And my plan is by next Thursday to read volume two as well. They're very quick reads. They're graphic novels. So a lot of great visuals. One of the things I really love about the show is that it incorporates a lot of the visuals from the graphic novels. You'll notice in the show, if you've watched it, when they're cutting scenes, they often cut them and they look like panels from a comic book. There's these moments in the book when, you know, Charlie first kind of experiences feelings for Nick and these leaves float past the panel to kind of symbolize the emotions that he's feeling. And so in the show, they have these little animated leaves that fly through the scene. So even though it's a live action adaptation of a graphic novel, they do keep some of that artwork in it. And I really appreciated that. One thing that surprised me about volume one is in the show, you get introduced to a lot of different characters pretty quickly. But in volume one, at least, it mostly focuses on Nick and Charlie and Tal, Charlie's best friend, does show up. But you don't meet the whole kind of core group of friends. I will be interested to read the second volume and see how they introduce these other characters that I know are part of the series. I haven't read that or watched the show, so need to get on that. Add it to my list of thousands of other things I would like to read and watch. Yeah, the show is very bingeable and it's just super sweet. Falling in love for the first time. There's a little bit of drama because you need something to keep the story interesting, but it's mostly just this sweet love story between these two high school boys. Well, my book is not sweet. (laughs) At all. (laughs) We never pick similar (laughs) themes, right? With banned books, you read about like sexual assault and I'm reading about children racing each other in the schoolyard. (laughs) That's what keeps it interesting. (laughs) So we can we can connect to our listeners who like various types of novels, cinema, entertainment. So the book I chose this month was Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. This book was a lot. And I will say I'm kind of having the opposite problem that I usually have when we record these podcast episodes. Usually I've just started reading the book, so I can't give spoilers. This one I read the first week of the month. And now here we are getting near the end of the month and I've forgotten some of it. So I still (laughs) can't give spoilers because I don't remember. I did listen to the audio of this one and the audio was really good. It's about two different families. So they live in this place called Shaker Heights. That's this kind of upscale neighborhood. And there's the Richardson family who, like I said, they live in this upscale neighborhood. It's two sons and and two daughters. It's not important. Yeah, four children, two sons, two daughters. And then Mrs. Richardson has a rental property that she rents out to people who she feels like need somewhere to stay. It's kind of like a 
charity project for her. And she rents out her property to a woman named Mia Warren and her daughter, Pearl. Pearl ends up becoming close with the Richardson kids, and so we get some of their perspectives. It switches to Mrs. Richardson. I think her name is Elena or Elena. The show and the book pronounce them differently since I listened to the audio. They get close. Things ensue. It's all about family dynamics. Pretty much all of the characters are terrible people, but like you want to know what happens. And there's this side story of this custody battle that's happening with another family. Like they're not even involved, but like the things that are happening in the custody battle kind of mirror some of the things going on with the Richardsons and with Mia and Pearl. So it's it's a lot. And this one was made into a show on Hulu in 2020. I really wanted to watch the show because it's got Carrie Washington and Reese Witherspoon as Mrs. Richardson and Mia Warren. So I was really interested. But after I read the book, I started watching the show and only made it two episodes in and kind of gave up. That's no fault of the show. I just like I already knew what happened. I was just kind of done. I will say there's a few differences. So in the book, Mia is a white woman. And in the show, she's cast as Carrie Washington. So then they add in some race elements. Part of it is that Mrs. Richardson has Mia come work in her house as like a housekeeper. And in the book, it's just kind of, you know, glossed over like, yeah, come work for me. But in the show, it's, well, don't you people usually work in people's houses? And Mia's like, what do you mean you people? I enjoyed it. The narrator was great in the audiobook. It's just a lot. It's about family secrets and family dynamics. It's also, like I said, it's super unlikable characters. So you have to be in a certain mood to want to watch it. And I haven't returned to that place yet. It's like the book Gone Girl. I read that book. That is another book that is all about unlikable people yes. doing terrible things to one another. And I still to this day have not watched the movie because I just like after finishing the book, I was like, I never want to be with those characters ever again. They are terrible people. I'll say it was frustrating, but Gone Girl is a good movie. <laughs> I saw it in the theater. Wow. That's a lot to sit through in a movie theater. With my mom. <laughs> So if you know what happens in that book, there's a very graphic scene towards the end that was kind of awkward to sit next to my mom and watch. I'll just leave it at that. No spoilers, but <laughs> it was a lot. It's a scene with, I forget her name. Rosamund Pike. Yes, Rosamund Pike and Neil Patrick Harris. If you know, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I prefer Rosamund Pike as Jane Bennett in The Bread and Prejudice with Karen Knightley. Speaking of books to screen. Yeah. <laughs> I almost put Gone Girl on my list of other books to talk about, but I didn't. Okay. Well, I'm glad I didn't spoil that then. No. I didn't put it on my list because I've never seen the movie, so I can't. I've, I've read a lot of books that have been made into movies and TV shows, but I realized I haven't watched a lot of them. And maybe that's just my like prejudice against the book is never going to be be outshone by the movie, right? The movie is never going to be as good. So maybe not disappoint myself. <laughs> I was kind of running into the opposite problem where I had seen a lot of the movies and hadn't read the books. Like I wanted to include something by Stephen King, but there are very few of his books I've actually read. And I've seen all the movies. I've read Misery and seen the movie and some of the newer ones like The Outsider was an HBO show. Well, I have read The Shining and I've seen the film, but I have did not include that one in. But if we want to talk about Stephen King book, we can talk about The Shining. I've read that one. And again, like I've seen The Shining, but I've never read the book. So I have to say the book is really well written. It's a five star read for me, like five stars out of five stars. So before we get too off track by just randomly just talking. talking about <laughs> other books that aren't in our lists, <laughs> let's get into our actual list, because the last time we did something similar to this, we talked literally forever, literally it was over and an hour. Sarah had to edit it way down. So we're going to try to save her this time <laughs> by sticking to the script. There you go. Except list, not script, because obviously we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> this is unscripted <laughs> if you can't tell. So why don't you start? Because I feel like I've just been talking a lot. The first book that I have on my list is American Gods by Neil Gaiman. And I will preface this by saying that I've only seen the first season of the show. There's three seasons, but I only had access to stars for one year because then my brother canceled his subscription, which meant my <laughs> access got canceled as well. So I watched the first season and it 
does a really great job of translating this really huge meandering book. At the center of it, you have this story about a gentleman named Shadow who has served some time in prison and he's getting out of prison. His wife dies in an automobile accident with his best friend and he's trying to get from where he got let out of prison back home so he can get to his wife's funeral. In the meantime, he runs into this kind of enigmatic character named Mr. Wednesday who wants to hire him as a chauffeur slash, you know, lackey. And as he's traveling with Mr. Wednesday, he's encountering all these amazing, fantastical situations and just everything is a little wonky and skewed. But what is really fascinating to me in reading the book and what I think they do a great job with in the show, at least the first season, is they integrate into this basic story, this history of all of these gods and what happens to a god when people stop worshiping them. What happens to a god from the old world when people migrate to a new world? Mr. Wednesday is Odin. If you don't get the reference, of course, Wednesday is named after Woden's Day. And you just meet all of these different characters, Egyptian gods, Native American gods, Celtic gods, Norse Norse gods, all sorts of different people. Anansi shows up. Mr. Nancy is what he goes by in American Gods. So you're seeing all of these gods that have traveled with these people to the new world and how then they live their lives having been forgotten, right? As the generations have gone on, people have stopped worshiping them. It's called American Gods because it's about all of these gods that have been brought to the new world, but then kind of abandoned and they're just scraping by. It's just, it's really fascinating. It's a, it's a huge kind of epic work, but I really love the book. And then the show, I think, has done a really great job. I I think it's the kind of show that if you haven't read the book, it might be a little like I have no idea what's happening right now because it is so intricate and amazing. And so it's definitely one that I think the television show brings those visuals to life, brings these characters to life in a way that really corresponds well with the book. Wow. (laughs) That's all I can say. That's deep. I haven't read it. Not much I can say. I mean, it's hard with Neil Gaiman. You know, I could have picked Coraline. I could have picked Stardust. But I thought American Gods is such a... <laughs> Sorry, I just, I forgot about Stardust. I could have, I haven't read the book though. So it, I wouldn't have added it to my list. But I really love that movie. So again, like I said, I keep running into, <laughs> I've seen the movies and haven't read the book. But a book I have read and then seen the movie adaptation of, the first on my list, is If I Stay by... Gail Foreman on my list of notes. I didn't put the others. (laughs) I knew that too. I was put on the spot and forgot. So If I Stay by Gail Foreman. It's about a girl named Mia who is in a car accident with her family. It's a snow day. They find out they have the day off school, her and her little brother. So they all get in the car to go to the grandparents' house and celebrate their snow day. And then the next thing she knows, she wakes up like on the ground in the snow while this car accident is going on. And then she sees herself being put into an ambulance. She's in a coma, but she's also there watching everything happen. It kind of goes back and forth between some backgrounds. So we get her family life. We can see her interacting with her little brother and her mom and dad and her boyfriend. Of course, this is a YA novel. So there's it's got that romance aspect to it, too. Also, I should note, since we always talk about music and instruments on this podcast, she plays the cello. And that's like a big part of her character. So it's got that kind of fantasy-esque element to it of she's kind of like a ghost walking around because it also like switches back to the present when she's in the hospital and like watching what's happening to her and her family and bad things happen (laughs) while she's ghost-like and she's watching it happen. So then she has to decide if she wants to stay or if she wants to pass on. Really enjoyed the book. I actually read it in one sitting, pretty close to when it came out. And then I saw the movie in theaters when it came out because I was really excited. It stars Chloe Grace Moretz as Mia. And I think it's really close to the book. So I really enjoyed the movie too. I don't think it got hyped up as much as it should have. I really love this movie. I have it on DVD now. 
not as fantastical as your first choice, <laughs> but still got some supernatural elements. Yeah. I've read the book, but I haven't seen the film. And I also read it in one day. I was just checking my Goodreads. So May 5th, 2018 is oh, when wow. I read that book. <laughs> I also read the sequel in one day. So it does have a sequel called Where She Went. I haven't read that one. Well, my next book on my list is Atonement by Ian McEwan. You might be familiar with the film version of Atonement starring Kira Knightley and James McAvoy are kind of the big top cast. And also uh, Shirsha Ronan plays Kira Knightley's little sister, who is really the main character of the book and has quite a critical role. The book is about you have Kira Knightley plays the daughter of a wealthy family and James McAvoy plays the son of a guy that works for that family. And he has, with her father's help, been able to go to Oxford and get an education. On the surface, at least, he has the education and the ability to get a good job and all of that, which would make him on like an even par with Keira Knightley's character. But of course, this is pre-World War II, Great Britain, where there still is a very strong social structure. Her family is wealthy and hires people to work for them. And he is the son of a person that gets hired to work for a wealthy family. And their relationship is is fraught. And the little sister observes some tense moments between the older sister and this gentleman that come across as maybe a little violent. There's some arguing and passionate interactions. And she, as a 13-year-old, doesn't quite understand what's happening. And so when it ends up that a guest on their property is sexually assaulted, the little sister says that she saw James McAvoy's character in the environs of where this happened and he gets in trouble for this sexual assault that he was not a part of. You fast forward in the novel to World War II and the 13-year-old girl has grown up to work for the war effort as a nurse, but she's also now a writer and she's writing about these events that have really affected her life because of course now as a young woman, she understands more of what she saw happening between her sister and this guy that she didn't understand at 13. Atonement is the name of the novel. So of course, she is seeking atonement. She is seeking forgiveness for the fact that she's driven her sister in the sky apart because of her lies. And she is a writer. So she writes about what happens once she's grown up and she's trying to seek this atonement. Hmm. I'm bad at segues. But (laughs) my next book... (laughs) So I mentioned that I didn't include Gone Girl on my list because I included this book instead. So I'm doing Dark Places by Jillian Gillian. I think it's Jillian. Jillian Jillian. Jillian Flynn. Of her three novels, so Gone Girl, Dark Places, and Sharp Objects, they've all had adaptations. I'd say Gone Girl is probably the best adaptation. And then maybe Sharp Objects. It was an HBO show. And then Dark Places, as far as the movies go. But Dark Places was my favorite of her books. A super convoluted story. But the basis is that Libby Day was seven years old when her entire family was murdered, except for her brother. And she testifies that she sees her 15-year-old brother murder her family. Oh, well, see, this ties into atonement. So, yeah. So it's <laughs> but so she testifies, but it's not like a lie. She She 100% believes at seven that her brother killed her family. So then we fast forward to when she's an adult and this kind of true crime group approaches her to see like if she'll talk to them because they believe her brother is innocent. So as she's talking to this group of people, she starts to question what she actually saw when she was seven. And then as the reader, you realize it's like way more complicated than what she even thought she saw when she was seven. I won't get into the whole thing because I don't want to give too many spoilers because part of the fun of this book for me was just finding out all of this stuff. But the movie, like I said, it's not great and it was kind of underhyped, but it does star Charlize Theron as Libby. So she's the main character as an adult, obviously. So we do get the flashbacks in the movie as well as the book to what's actually happening when she's little. And then it kind of goes into her thinking about it as an adult. And I kind of inadvertently did this to where 
a lot of the movies of my list star the same actresses. So Chloe Grace Moretz is also in Dark Places. She's the brother. His name is Ben. When he's 15, he has a girlfriend and she plays the girlfriend. And this is another one where they're pretty much all terrible people. There's like some occult devil worshiping stuff happening between Ben and the girlfriend. I don't remember her name, which is part of the reason why they think that this family was murdered because of the devil. That's actually not what happened. I'll just go ahead and say that. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of the occult, mm. my next one I picked is a little bit of not literary <laughs> novel. It's the Sookie Stackhouse series oh. or <laughs> Southern Vampire Mysteries known in the TV world as True Blood. And the first book in that series is called Dead Until Dark. It's by Charlene Harris. And I've actually met Charlene Harris. She came and did an author talk at the university where my brother works. And I happened to be visiting when she was there. So we went to that and she's a very delightful woman. It's sort of weird when you read her books, which get a little graphic in the you know, steamy department. But you meet her and she's just just like your grandma. And so it's a little bit disconcerting. Like the woman behind True Blood is that lady. Okay. The first season of the show and the first book in the series, Dead Until Dark, are very, very similar. They follow pretty much what happens. They start to diverge as you move through the series. There are some characters like Lafayette who dies in the book series, spoiler alert, but who is probably the best part of True Blood. So thankfully, they did not kill off Lafayette Reynolds, my cousin. <laughs> it's campy. And I think that that's the thing I really like about the Dead Until Dark series is that it's not trying to be too serious. And I think sometimes the show got to be trying to be a little too serious, whereas the books really keep that silly aspect like they embrace it right. There's in the second book, there's these people who are meeting up for an orgy and Sookie wants to go and investigate because she thinks that there's murders happening and that the murderer is part of this orgy. But she doesn't want to go by herself because who wants to go to an orgy by themselves? So she... It's not going to be the title of this episode. <laughs> I know. Oh, gosh. So <laughs> We're going to have to check the explicit box. <laughs> So she asks Eric, who is played by Alexander Skarsgård in the show, to go with her. And he shows up and he's in these hot pink leggings and like a tank top because his idea of what sexy orgy wear is, is I don't know, from like 1985. But I like it's just moments like that where you're just like, I love this because it's so ridiculous. And it is fun because Dead Until Dark takes place in rural northern Louisiana, which is where my brother lives. So I like to imagine like I know exactly where Shreveport is. I've been to Shreveport. That's where Eric lives. And I want to go to Fantasia and Shreveport because I think that would be great. So it's kind of fun because I know the locales in my brain. I kind of can see it all. And I think the first season did a really great job of trying translating that. And like I said, they got a little divergent towards the end, but that first season, I think it's solid. So that one I actually have seen. That's why I'm like sitting over here giggling this whole time. But yeah. True Blood is so campy. And the books are too. Like the in the first chapter, I think they're talking about how Sookie is pleased as punch that she <laughs> is, you know, what, like tanning in her yard or whatever. So my next one is a little more serious, kind of. I mean, it's just a completely different book. So, and movie. My next one is One Day by David Nichols. And I just recently learned last night as I was making this list that this book is going to be made into a Netflix series next year. And I'm kind of mad because I really like the movie. It stars Anne Hathaway and Jim Sturgis. And I don't know if there's any fans of the movie across the universe, but he's the main character in that movie and he has a great singing voice. And he's in this movie with Anne Hathaway set in London. So Anne Hathaway does have a British accent through the whole movie. <laughs> the premise is Emma and Dexter meet on the night of their graduation. It's July 15th. And then we kind of follow them and their friendship turned relationship because obviously throughout that same day over 20 years. So the two of them on July 15th from the day they met up until 20 years later, the end. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, that's pretty much it. I don't want to give too much away. I don't know how they're going to make it into a series. I feel like the movie was enough and the book. Are they going to do 20 episodes for each actual day that they meet each other? Or I don't know. So yeah, I'm still still a little bitter that they're redoing it. I'm like, get new material, people. 
but <laughs> but yeah, I really liked this movie and the book. Well, and a tie-in, you mentioned the film Across the Universe, and it's Jim Sturgis and Evan Rachel Wood, and she played <laughs> Sophie Ann LeClerc. Ah, who uh, was the vampire queen of Louisiana yep, in sure the did. True Blood series. So full circle. Yeah. Speaking of television shows that the longer they go on, the more they don't become like the books they are based on. My next one is another huge one, an HBO show, Game of Thrones. I have read all of the currently published books in A Song of Ice and Fire, and I am still mad at George R. R. Martin <laughs> that he has not published Winds of Winter because he has been telling us that Winds of Winter was going to be coming out for, I don't know, 10 years now. <laughs> like, what did he even do during quarantine? I know. He already has full, complete chapters of Winds of Winter completed because he's leaked chapters. So how is Winds of Winter not, we're never going to actually know what happens in Westeros because he is going to die before he publishes Winds of Winter or A Dream of Spring which I'm very angry about, especially because I was so disappointed by the way the show ended. And I believe that the book series will end in the same way that the show ended, but I also believe that George R. R. Martin will get us there in a way that is a lot more plausible and I will buy into it a lot more than the way it was presented in the show. My biggest complaint with the show is that you can tell when the books stop because the show goes from being really nuanced and interesting into just a bunch of action sequences piled on top of each other and not a lot of character development and you know those nuanced parts of the world that I think is what makes the series so incredible. But I do love that both the show and the books start with this kind of prologue moment where you see these people riding out from the wall and at the point that you're starting the show, the starting reading the book, you don't know what the wall is. They're just these guys dressed for women Winter, leaving this giant walled fortress, going out, and you know they encounter what uh, we learn later are the others in the book or the White Walkers in the show. All of those characters in that first chapter, that prologue chapter, are all dead within you know the first part of the book and I love that right like let's start with these people that you're gonna meet and you're gonna get to know a little bit and then we're gonna just kill them all off it's it's the great dramatic moment of Ned Stark's beheading right you can't like kill off the main character is that a spoiler I feel like everyone knows that Ned Stark got beheaded it's the first season Sean Bean always dies I know Sean Bean always dies spoiler alert <laughs> I think that's all I have to say about Game of Thrones. I love the books. The show got really disappointing the further it went on. See, I think I ran into the issue of I've seen the show and then I tried to read the book like after watching the show and was just so thrown off by the fact that the characters are so much younger mm. in the book than they're presented in the show. Right. It's may have in the Middle Ages been a thing to marry off a 13-year-old girl, but it's another thing to like watch a 13-year-old girl marry Khal Drogo. Yeah. So it's a good thing that they didn't do that in the show because I don't think it would have lasted very long because everyone would have been disgusted by it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the only tie-in to my next book is that it's kind of fantasy, I guess, but it's like I, middle grade, maybe we'll say middle grade. It's a middle grade novel. I remember buying this book at the Scholastic Book Fair when I was fifth or sixth grade. Maybe I could probably look up the dates, but I don't care that much. <laughs> so Ella Enchanted oh, by Gail. Speaking of Anne Hathaway. Gail Carson Levine. Yes, exactly. I said I didn't do it on purpose, but Anne Hathaway is in the movie. It's a Cinderella retelling. And when Ella, in this book, is born, her fairy godmother, Lucinda, gives her the gift of obedience. She always has to do what she's told. And that's pretty much what I remember from the book, because when I read it, I was really young. <laughs> and then the movie came out. <laughs> and it's so different. And it's so bad that it's good. <laughs> yeah. The movie is 100% different from the book. The only thing that's the same is her name is Ella. She is in love with Prince Charmant. And she does have the fairy godmother named Lucinda and she's obedient. But the movie like really over exaggerates it. And every time somebody tells her to do something, there's like a little ding sound and she like shrugs her shoulders back and stands up really straight and then does the thing she's told to do. And there's 
<laughs> the scene in the movie that that's probably an inside joke that you're not going to think is funny, but I think it's hilarious because I watched this in college with my college roommates. And there's a scene in the movie where she like eventually she breaks this gift or curse that she's given to be obedient. And in the movie, when it happens, I don't want to tell you like what happens. And it's also different from when she breaks the spell in the book. But in the movie, she like yells, I will no longer be obedient. <laughs> And then we would just say that all the time after watching this movie when somebody would ask us to do something. We're like, no, I will no longer be obedient. But in just in the context of the scene in the movie, it's just ridiculous. But there's also in the movie there. Well, in the book, too, there are giants. But in the movie, Heidi Klum plays one of the giants. So there's that. <laughs> Carrie Elwes is in the movie as like an evil king who's not in the book. And there's a talking snake that he has as a pet that's not in the book. It's I mean, it's ridiculous and there's musical numbers so Anne Hathaway sings in this one she sings somebody to love by Queen and then there's a whole dancing musical number at the end don't go breaking my heart is what they all sing together at the end of the movie it's just absolutely ridiculous I liked the book but I love the movie for all the wrong reasons it's terrible but that's why I like it. <laughs> well, speaking of Carrie Ellis being in a movie, I actually had more than five books on my list. So I was trying to pick which one I wanted to talk about as my fifth option. When you said Carrie Ellis, I was like, okay, I got to do this one. So the fifth book on my list is Dracula by Bram Stoker. I did want to include some classics because, you know, there's those classics that have been remade into shows and movies and plays and all sorts of things. And so I didn't want to go. I already talked about Jane Eyre before and I thought mm, Jane Austen is a little like too on the nose. Let's do Dracula because actually I didn't read that until I was an adult and I found it a lot more enjoyable to read than I was imagining it was going to be. But Carrie Elwes plays Lord Arthur Holmwood in the movie, but more famously, Gary Oldman plays Dracula. And when this movie came out, I had a huge crush on Gary Oldman and was just appalled by him as like the old Dracula that Keanu Reeves meets at the beginning because like he's like so old and gross looking. But then he like comes to London and he has his long curly hair and his top hat and his little circular glasses and he's super dreamy. <laughs> And Winona Ryder is in it. Anthony Hopkins is in it. And like I mentioned, Keanu Reeves, he plays Winona Ryder's fiance. It's just fun to see the ways in which a character like Dracula has been reimagined throughout. So this is the movie from, I think, 92, sometime in the early 90s that I most associate with the book to screen version of Dracula. But there have been other adaptations. You know, Dracula even shows up in an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So two vampire novels I on know, your list. I do read a lot of vampire novels. <laughs> so I, I couldn't do a list without a murder mystery detective story. I am going to break the six degrees of Kevin Bacon thing we have going on because I don't know any of the actors who are actually in this adaptation. And we're going full circle because we started with your stars adaptation of American Gods and we're ending with a stars adaptation. Well, there you go. Dublin Murders. But the book I'm talking about, because the show is actually based on two Tana French novels, In the Woods and The Likeness. But I'm going to talk about The Likeness because that's my favorite of her novels. It's the second one she wrote. So they're kind of a series, the Dublin Murder Squad series, but they all stand alone. They just, some of the characters show up in the different novels. So Cassie Maddox is in In the Woods and In the Likeness, but she's more of the main character of The Likeness. This is set in Ireland. Obviously, it's Dublin murder. So like all of the actors in the show are Irish people who I haven't seen in anything else. So I don't know. So the, the premise of the likeness book and section of the show are that Cassie is a detective who used to work undercover. And when she worked undercover, she used the alias Lexi Madison. And she gets called onto this murder case. And when she gets there, she realizes the victim looks just like her. And she's all freaked out about it. And then she's even more freaked out when they discover that her name was Lexi Madison, the alias that she used to use. Ooh. They're trying to find out who this person is. How does she look exactly like me? And why is she using this name? Because we know it's like a fake made up name. So why is she using this Lexi Madison alias? So in order to find out... She goes undercover, again, using the alias because she looks exactly like this murdered girl to find out what happened. So it's this group of friends that live in this house together and she moves in and is pretending to be this person who they all lived with, who you would think they would realize she was acting different, but they don't, <laughs> at least not at first, they don't, to find out what happened. I think the show did a really good job. 
of showing this to you, even though it was only a piece of the series since the series was based off both novels. So that's where we're we're ending with murder. Well, if you want to have some more six degrees of separation. Oh, do you know some of the actors? <laughs> One of the actors, I recognized him immediately. I didn't do too deep of diving, but Conlith Hill, who plays Superintendent O'Kelly. Okay. He was Lord Varys in the Game of Thrones series. You know, the bald eunuch. Yeah. So he might have had hair because in real life he has hair. He's a hairy individual. (laughs) Um, I mean, like in the picture I'm looking at of him right now, he's got a beard and everything. But yeah, so Conlith Hill is Mm -hmm. our... Dublin, what is it? Dublin Murders. Dublin Murders and Game of Thrones actor. So they all connect to each other. I mean, when you said it was all Irish actors, I was like, there's got to be someone from Game of Thrones on there. All right. Yeah. (laughs) I think we've rambled enough. And we're just going to say, have a great. Have a great. How now, brown cow? (laughs) I never saw a purple cow. I never hoped to see one. But I can tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. Oh.